Howdy, Psych92 here, and in this video we are going to see how we can create enclosures for our DIY synth projects. And we're going to go all the way from something super hacky, like this enclosure here for my MIDI controlled Atari Punk console, to something a bit more robust like this here 3D printed enclosure for my bit base design. So basically I'm going to try to cover enclosure design for people who want something that's super quick and dirty and then also for people who are willing to buy a 3D printer and want to make an enclosure that's going to take up the least amount of space and also just look the nicest. Again super sorry for the long delay in between videos here. Like I said I've been looking for a job. Thankfully I have found one. I'm going to be an embedded software engineer for a certain audio company that I don't want to get into right now. Um, um, but besides that, I've also been apartment hunting, so my next video will probably be in my new apartment. Um, but yeah, that's the update on that. Anyways, let's get into enclosure design, because this should be a super fun video and a really nice way to end the BitBase series. In the last video, I designed an Atari Punk console that could be controlled by MIDI. So if you haven't seen that video already and you want to know how I did that, you can refer to the last video, which should be in one of the cards on one of these corners. Uh, anyways, that's going to be the basis for our DIY hacky enclosure. If you did watch that video, you'll remember that where we left off, the design was still on breadboard. Well, what we need to do in order to get it into an enclosure first is we need to make it rigid enough that it's going to be able to withstand it. So the next step is to take that and turn it into protoboard instead. So protoboard is basically just regular breadboard, but with plated through holes instead. So what you need to do to make the connections is you just solder on jumper wires or use component leads uh, to make the connections instead. So when I'm doing a really simple project like this, usually what I do is I take each of the components off of my breadboard and then put it onto my uh, protoboard one at a time. And that way I make sure that I get the exact same connections that were on my working breadboard and transfer them onto my protoboard and it should work the exact same. And one of the big differences between protoboard and a breadboard is that you also have on a breadboard the horizontal connections. So each of the holes is connected horizontally. And if you like that design, you can also go with strip board. A lot of people prefer strip board to proto board. I prefer to just use jumpers. Anyways, when the proto board was done, I tested it to make sure that it was working, and then I went to find a suitable enclosure. I ended up finding one of these ammo boxes, which is nice and durable, and the perfect size for the circuit board that I was using. The next steps were really mounting all the hardware on here. So the first thing I did was drill out holes to mount the potentiometers and the switches, and then also the audio jack. And once I was done drilling the holes, I mounted the hardware on there. I cut out some rectangular holes for the MIDI connectors. And then I also hot glued the battery holder and the circuit board in place in the enclosure. So as you can see, to make an enclosure like this is really easy. All you really need is the hardware and then the mounting hardware to go with that. And then also you might need a drill press and then a hot glue gun. Or if you have a hand drill, you could probably use that as well. This was the end result for the MIDI controlled Atari Punk console. Now it's not the coolest looking enclosure that I've ever seen, but it does the job. And really what I've been going for anyway recently is just minimalism and taking up the minimal amount of space. So if you've seen the first video in my BitBase series, you know that this isn't the only enclosure that I've designed this way. These two are examples of enclosures that I've built that are quite a bit more aesthetically pleasing in my opinion. There are also a lot of other examples that you can find of people making enclosures out of old video game consoles, Altoid tins, 
toys, hard cardboard, and a bunch of other materials. So really it's just about being creative and finding cool things to mount your hardware onto. And now they're usually pretty stable, but material choice is definitely a consideration if you're gonna be playing these instruments regularly. So you really don't wanna use things like soft cardboard, for example. The big downside is that you usually end up with an enclosure that has way more space than your circuit actually requires. So let's use that as a really cheap segue to our next topic, which is the magical powers of 3D printing. For the next part, we're gonna need some software and hardware tools. As for the hardware parts, you're gonna need a 3D printer. My 3D printer over here is the Monoprice Maker Select V2, which was around $200 at the time I purchased it. These days, you can actually get a much better 3D printer for that price range, and a lot of people recommend the Creality Ender 3 as the top dog in the $200 price range. Now, obviously, to go with your 3D printer, you're going to need 3D printer filament. Uh, this stuff here is actually PLA, which is what I prefer because it's super easy to print with and also it's supposedly somewhat biodegradable. There are downsides to PLA though. The biggest one of them being that it's not very heat resistant. So it can actually get soft even on a really hot day in direct sunlight. There are plenty of other materials that address this issue. There's PETG, ABS, nylons, and there's even actually some PLA variants that do high temperature resistance as well. I've never actually had an issue with the temperature resistance of PLA, so what I've been using for my functional parts is Isan's PLA Plus, which is a bit more impact resistant than normal PLA and is generally just better for functional parts. Anyways, that's the hardware end of things. For the software end, we're gonna need two different pieces of software. The first of these softwares is something to design the enclosure in. We're going to need a CAD program, and CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. There are a couple really great softwares out there for CAD, but what I prefer is Autodesk's Fusion 360. It's great because it's completely free for makers and also small startups as well, so that was super awesome of Autodesk to do. And it does have quite a bit of a learning curve though, so you also might wanna try starting off with something like Tinkercad instead. Once you have your models designed, the next thing you need to do is generate what's called G-code, which is really just instructions for the 3D printer to print it. And the program that does that is called a slicer because it takes a model and slices it into layers basically for the 3D printer to build upon. There are a lot of great slicers out there and the good thing is that most of them are free. I do occasionally use a slicer called Simplify 3D, uh, which is $150, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to be using Cura, which is entirely free. Anyways, really the best way to show you guys how this stuff works is to actually just jump into the software. I'm not gonna go super deep into detail on how this stuff works because again, this is not a tutorial series on how to do CAD and how to 3D print, but I'm going to show you the basics of the software and, and hopefully give you guys a place that you can jump off of if you wanna explore this stuff. All right, so I just launched up Fusion 360 and the first thing that you're probably gonna notice is that I'm actually running Windows 10 for this instead of Linux, which is what I normally use. And the reason for that is just because uh, CAD usually requires a lot of graphics card usage, so my Windows 10 PC has a better graphics card, so I typically use uh, this. All right, so with that side note out of the way, the very first thing that I do when, I'm, when I have a project done, so like when I have my circuit board designed and all laid out and I've fabricated it and I know it's working, the next thing that I do is I usually start with the board itself. So this is the exact dimensions of the circuit board for Bitbase. Then what I do is I usually um, model the tallest components on it so that I have a reference of how much space I need to work with. So, you know, I have things, capacitors, uh, that's the Arduino there, um, adding the MIDI connectors, the batteries, where those are gonna go. Then the next step is to take the hardware that I know is going to need to be there. So, in this case, you know, I have a switch that's right here. I have potentiometers all throughout here. And typically I'm placing these as close to the board as possible to take up the least amount of space as possible, but also watching out for these capacitors and other things that might be in the way. Now what comes next varies uh, from project to project. Sometimes I like to start with the top of the enclosure. Sometimes I like to start with the bottom of the enclosure. Sometimes it's one solid thing. In this case, I started with the bottom of the enclosure. And so since this isn't a Fusion 360 tutorial, I'm not gonna, you know, go, I'm not gonna detail how exactly I made this, 
But basically, what I was doing when I was creating the bottom of this enclosure here is, you know, I'm cutting out things that I need for um, the power connectors here, the USB, the MIDI connectors, the uh, audio and power jacks here, um, the battery cover on the bottom here. And then these slits here are is, is going to be because this enclosure is gonna be snap fit, meaning it doesn't need any additional hardware. So I'll, I'll go over that a little bit later. And then you can also see I've modeled in a couple other things. This is like slots for the PCB so that it sits in there nicely and doesn't move when it's all put together. And then also this is uh, for the batteries. And then you'll also notice that there's this kind of overhang here um, for the battery cover because that's going to be snap fit as well. So then for this project, the next thing that I did was model the top of the enclosure. And the divots I'm gonna explain uh, in a little bit as to what I, what's going on with these as the graphics and the text here. But the main goal that I was doing here was, uh, again, cutting out for the MIDI connectors, cutting out for the um, shafts of the potentiometers, then also for this button that I'm gonna show you in a bit, the on and off switch. And then the most important part was getting the snap fit right here. So if I remove the bottom of the enclosure here, you can see that we have these protrusions here. And basically these, when they're pushed in, they end up snapping into this bottom enclosure. And that's what these divots are, are, for, are on the bottom part of the enclosure. And it snaps in place. And of course, I didn't just uh, design all this and then try it a million times until I got it to work. Instead, what I usually do is I create these test files here. So, you know, this is a small box here, and then this is the top of that. And in th this was the first design that I tried, which was really bad. Um, then I moved on to this one here, which was a little bit better but still didn't work out the way that I wanted to. And eventually I just ended up using the cantilever design that I, that you see there. So if I remove the bottom here, you can see that it's roughly the same exact concept. Then one of the final um, parts of this was the fact that, so on the board here, we have this switch here, but this is the front of the, this is the front panel of the synth. So we really need some kind of an extension here to push this button. So basically what I did was I modeled this, which was, is the extension to push that button. And the way that that works, that's actually also snap fit. So basically you have the, the switch top here, which pushes and snaps into this uh, switch bottom here and then that one pushes the actual button. And then you can see that that's the part where it goes in, like that. And then the last part uh, that I was telling you about is, is it's kind of gonna be more uh, evident in Cura, which is the slicer that we're gonna use. But basically these divots here, the reason that they're there is because our very first layer is actually going to be two prints because the first one is going to be these graphics here, which is going to be the gold, and then then it's after I print this gold part here, then we're gonna print the rest of the top of the enclosure. And then finally, I also designed these knobs which just push onto the um, potentiometers and they fit in pretty well. So after all that, you get a pretty nice looking enclosure here. Here's the, the um, battery cover as well, which snap fits into there. All right, so this is Cura, which is my slicer of choice for this project. And this is gonna be a super brief overview of the slicing process. And the very first thing that we're gonna do is import a, mo a model, which in my case, I've already done. Basically, you go up here and then import a STL file, which for my case, this is the bottom of the enclosure. So once I have that model in and it's looking good, I'm gonna go and check on my print settings. And I'm gonna briefly explain some of these here. So layer height is just how tall each layer is, so each, time the print head moves and lays down a layer of plastic, how tall that layer of plastic is. Then the next thing, important thing anyway, is the wall line count. And basically, as, it, as this is an object here, it's going to sur like make a perimeter around each part of it, and the how many times it makes a perimeter around it is the wall line count. And 
For a lot of my functional parts, I actually use three. For this project, I just used two and I, I found it was fine, but it, for a lot of mine, I use three. Top and bottom layers is exactly like that sounds. You know, four uh, full uh, top and bottom layers without any infill. And then infill here is basically there's, you know how there's a perimeter around it? Well, there's on the inside is going to be some type of pattern. And in my case, it's just a grid pattern. I find that that's fine and it's going to be 20% full, so it's not gonna be a solid object. Since I'm using PLA Pro, I'm using 210 for the temperature for printing, since it does run a little bit hotter than normal PLA, which is around 200. I'm not gonna go through any of the speed or travel settings or even the cooling, because we just, for PLA, leave that on 100% fan cooling, but I am gonna go over the support. So. I tried to print this model with by not needing any support, but there are some parts that need it. So a good example of that is this overhang here for the battery holder. Um, and then also these divots here. Anyways, it's better to visualize this by actually slicing it. So next I'm going to hit um, slice, which would normally be here. Looks like I already did it though. So in this case, I'm gonna hit preview because it's already been sliced. And now with this view, you can actually see exactly what the printer is gonna do. So. This is the very first layer. And then we can see that it's laying down some support here and we go up and as we lay more layers down, you can also see that there's more support forming over here. And then also we can see our infill, which is this pattern here. Then it goes up and then you can see we have this bridging over here and that support is gonna remove or you're gonna be able to pull that out. And it's just going to form a better bottom surface on that. And then finally, when we get to the divots up here, you can also see that we're creating support there as well. And then you see they get a better bridge there and that's it. Then finally, once we're done with that, we hit save to file, which will save a, a .g code file, which is going to save all these instructions for our 3D printer. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the other objects or the other STL files, but basically the process is the exact same. And finally, we're left with this pretty cool looking enclosure. Uh, it's definitely not perfect. The text and graphics didn't come out as clearly as I would have liked them to, but with the printer that I have, which does have a warped bed, I think it came out uh, pretty well. So now I'm left with two musical instruments that I made entirely by myself, which I think is pretty cool. So in this video, I showed you how to use ProtoBoard for super simple projects like the MIDI controlled Atari Punk Console. Then I showed you how to make really hacky enclosures out of common household items. And then we went into a bit more depth on how to make more complicated enclosures using CAD and 3D printing. And really that's it for the BitBase series. I think I'm gonna make one more video which is going to be a demonstration of both of these instruments. But after this, I'm going to be taking the channel in a slightly different direction. I'll have more news about that in the video after the next one. But for now, that's about it. So I'll see you guys in the next one, later.